Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you for being here. Today we end up the 2007 edition of the sister, uh, the sister summer internship. Before, so today we have the each student. I mean, each group of students will present their uh, their final project. They spend the last two months uh, doing the, this project, the project that they are going to present today. Uh, before we start, I would like to thank all the people that participated in the, um, in the summer school. The students, of course. Without them, we wouldn't have the summer school. Then the supervisors, uh, namely Ricardo Severino and Paulo Valtarejo, uh, which actively participated <coughs> and meet with the students to help them um, concluding their, or doing their um, activities during the, the, their final project. The lecturers, of course, because uh, besides Ricardo and Paulo and myself, uh, Luiz Nogueira, David Pereira also contributed to the, with the lectures, and the Miguel Albano as well. Um, and obviously the, the people that organized or uh, took care of the organization of uh, everything, like uh, um, Philippe, um, Cristiana, which also helped uh, with these things. And probably I'm forgetting uh, some people, but I would like to thank you everyone. Uh, to thank everyone involved. So the first presentation will be given by uh, uh, Bernard, uh, which will present a project uh, that uh, is related with wireless sensor networks. Basically, if I'm not wrong, he deployed several sensors throughout Sister's building. And the objective was to use some kind of decentralized uh, communication to gather information about the, um, the temperature, if I'm not wrong, uh, of the temperature points in the different, uh, of, that is being collected by the different sensors uh, that were deployed in the system. So I guess that okay. we can start. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, basically, Claudio said everything about my project. Our project. Um, so uh, it it came uh, to be because there was a problem we needed to solve, and uh, that problem uh, was that sister is spending a lot of his budget in uh, uh, cooling and heating different rooms, and uh, the problem about this is uh, there are shared conduits that uh, are um, in rooms on the third floor uh, that uh, have sun all day and on the first floor we, have, uh, we don't have sun at all during the day. So obviously if someone in the third floor is feeling the, the room is hotter, we'll turn on the air conditioning and the people here in the first floor will feel a lot colder because they don't have as much uh, 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 sun during the day. So obviously the temperature will be lower. So, uh, to try to uh, mitigate this and to know uh, which temperature should we uh, have all rooms in and uh, that kind of things, uh, we developed this uh, this project. Uh, basically, uh, the project was to monitor the temperature and humidity of the all the rooms in the building. Um, and uh, it will be uh, it will be, it will be made using a wireless sensor network. Um, and uh, the the final the end goal of this is to help sister uh, make a more informed decision on how to control the temperature. So uh, the first objectives was were uh, to measure the temperature and humidity on various rooms. Uh, create a central database with all that information and to display it in a user-friendly way so uh, everyone can see it. There, are, there were additional goals that were uh, using <coughs> certain types of uh, communication stack uh, to increase the power saving of the nodes and uh, to try to use low memory uh, nodes for cost contention. So the solution we came up with uh, was uh, 
this is the overview. So we are using nodes uh, on every floor and they are separate from each other floor. So floor one is completely separate from floor two. They only communicate within their floor and um, the, the modes communicate between them in a mesh network and everything will be in the end gathered by a final nodes which will then communicate with uh, a Raspberry Pi which in turn will send to a central server all the data it gathered from that floor and then it will be displayed to the user. So uh, for sensing, uh, we needed a reliable sensor that uh, could uh, measure the temperature and humidity in the, in the levels we were trying to measure it. Uh, so uh, SHT11 uh, measures uh, between 15 and 30 degrees Celsius with a temperature to tolerance of uh, 0.75 degrees, which is, uh, I guess, pretty good. And it was present in Telos B and XM1000 that we had here in the, in the lab. Um, so for communication, uh, we needed a low power communication stack and uh, Professor Severino told us to use the SCH uh, to uh, achieve that. And uh, basically how it works is every uh, pair of uh, devices is assigned uh, for each time slot and for each channel uh, um, a time to uh, communicate so we can have multiple uh, devices communicated at the same time but without interference. This allows us to uh, make the radio uh, only turn on when it's needed, on, when it knows it will be transmitting and, uh, or receiving and to turn off otherwise. otherwise. Uh, for routing, we are also using uh, Ripple, for, uh, which is a routing protocol for lossy and low power networks, uh, which is our case. So, um, okay. um, so these were the devices we had. Uh, Telsby was a, bit, uh, a little bit cheaper than XM1000 but it had less ROM, and in terms of the sensor it was the same, and the CPU was pretty much the same as well, uh, and the radio uh, too, so we tried to use Telos B as much as possible and use XM1000 when uh, really needed. Um, in terms of the operating system, uh, we first tried to use uh, TinyOS, uh, which uses uh, NAS C, which is a, like a, a dialect of C, they uh, produced to, uh, to program this uh, operating system. And uh, the ripple over TSCA is not officially supported. I, there is a pull request to support it, but uh, it doesn't work in all devices. And there is no official support for, the, for XM1000. On the other hand, Contiki, which, which was our second choice, uh, used a C, which we were familiar with. Um, it has a, a ripple over TSCH example in the official repository and uh, also has orchestra, orchestra support. Uh, I didn't mention it, but orchestra is uh, an algorithm to uh, dynamically schedule the, 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 that matrix I, I, I saw, uh, showed you. So uh, the other way around, if we, if, if we hadn't uh, have uh, orchestra, we would have to statically and for each node uh, program the, the assign the, the schedule. <coughs> so orchestra is really a good uh, option. For collecting the data um, from the sensor network, we are using uh, Raspberry Pi, which parses the information that uh, the, the final the sync node sends to the serial port and then sends it to the database. It's written in Python and it's really simple. Uh, now, for aggregating the data, we have uh, another Raspberry Pi, but uh, it's a bit a slow, it's a little bit slow, but it's just a proof of concept. Um, it receives the data from all those uh, Raspberry Pis that parse the data from each floor. Um, it stores it in a, in a MySQL database uh, provides access using a REST API and finally serves the web application 
in which you see we see the information. So uh, along the way, we found some uh, problems. Uh, one of those was the ROM overflow. Telos B has only uh, 48 kilobytes of ROM, and uh, we tried to uh, uh, compile Ripple with the SCH and Orchestra, but it won't work out of, out of the box. So we, for development, used the NXM1000, which has a little more uh, memory. Uh, the problem was there was no support for the XM1000, but uh, Professor Severino uh, found uh, an implementation and showed us, so we could test it. But we also had another problem, which was the communication was not working, uh, because um, the implementation was not official, so some, uh, some macros and flags was, were updated, and so we, were, we had to dig through the platform specific codes to uh, finally understand what the problem was and update it and make it work. So uh, the problem, the project now um, allows communication between nodes. Uh, the parsing from the serial port is also, is is also functioning. Uh, the database and the API are set up and the website is available uh, to see. So uh, let me show you some screenshots I took. Um, this is the floor, so the idea is we can see the floor and information about it. Uh, we only had information for this, uh, uh, for the screenshots, but basically uh, the idea is we could see the, the information of all the room temperatures in, in this map, there's one for each floor, and uh, also we should be able to see all the, these are fake values, okay, <laughs> generated automatically, but the idea is we are, we are able to see the, um, the information uh, and the temperature, how it uh, uh, varies a long time and uh, uh, support us in our decisions. So, uh, I hope I can make this demonstration work uh, let me just try just to see it in action okay so this is the actual dashboard there are other floors here we can zoom in, zoom out, and there's also all the floors that uh, all the, the rooms Sister has. It's really basic, but we can see here. Uh, this is the data, because we've only started collecting data today. We only have data for today. Uh, but here, uh, I c we can see uh, the, the actual measurements one by one. Uh, we received. This is our only last ten uh, measurements we've we've received. Okay, so uh, getting back to the presentation. So uh, I think it's mostly working, uh, but there are some possible improvements we could make. Uh, one is in, in this map, we could show where the modes are located because this only tells us the, the temperature but we don't know where the modes that are uh, uh, measuring are located. So for example, if one mode is really close to an air conditioning <coughs> vent, probably it will be a lot uh, colder or hotter than the, 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 the average of the room. So that would be a nice to have. Um, also, uh, uh, Professor Sabino suggested this uh, to have a, a way to monitor the, the mode's energy level and uh, TELUSB and XM1000 I think have a, a battery sensor so we could do that uh, to uh, alert the user so we know when we should switch batteries uh, because they are running low on power. Um, another uh, additional goal that was not fulfilled would be to adjust the blinds of the building uh, according to the temperature 
So the third floor, for example, would uh, close the blinds when uh, when it was midday because it is the hottest uh, part of the day, and um, the fir uh, first floor would open them. And uh, yeah, upgrade the server because it's right now on a Raspberry Pi, it's a little bit slow. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Go ahead. So when you were describing the topology, uh, as far as I understood, basically there is uh, the several modes, and then uh, the data is collected on a single Raspberry Pi, one for each floor. Right? Yes. Can you comment more about this topology, and maybe there is some intuition why you decided like this, some benefits, drawbacks? Okay, uh, we've decided to use this topology because uh, we thought it, it would be uh, hard to make the modes communicate between floors, or uh, because uh, floors have a, a real thick uh, layer, so it will be hard. Uh, and uh, if we decide to do that, we have to put moats on the walls here around the stairs because it's a more open area. So it, I don't know if there is a necessity to monitor that area. So it will be if there wasn't a necessity to be like wasting a little bit of uh, of moats for uh, not a little. Uh, not much advantage. Um, yeah, I th does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, but I have one more. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so uh, this part, um, when we enter in the lobby, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's not about the floor, it's basically from the top to, to bottom, the whole open space where the stairs go, right? So it's mm -hmm. the, single, the single space is made through the several floors. Do you, uh, do you measure the temperature there? If yes, to which uh, to which Raspberry Pi the data goes? Um, okay. Yeah. When we enter to the building, yes, we have this big open space yes. where we can go out. Uh, yeah, with the stairs. Yeah. And this like the, the single uh, open space which goes through many floors, to three floors, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is whether you measure temperature there. Oh uh, no, we are not. In the, in no, that building. was not on our plans okay. to do, but. Uh, yeah, that will be would be a little bit difficult uh, because uh, since it's an open area and it's not right, uh, the limit of the floors, it's it's uh, a problem. We so have to see. people working there, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you would do, uh, you would install several modes like uh, uh, on top and then on bottom uh, because you know the the, the, yeah. the the hot air goes goes up, the cold air yeah. goes down. So basically yeah, we we need to do that. Yes, oh, one per floor. And probably one in this part where uh, it's still open, but it's uh, the the ceiling is uh, a lot uh, lower. Actually, I was going to ask. I mean, it's, it's kind of related. How many sensors do you need to deploy in a single room just to have like a, a good measure of the temperature in a room? Because of exactly what you were saying, because the air flows in the, from <coughs> bottom to up, if I'm not wrong. So, uh, I mean, because of the way. That it's, Designed? That, that obviously depends on the size of the room. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, if you're talking about uh, an office, uh, well, such as Pierre's for instance, okay. uh, probably two modes are enough. Like one, one like diagonal? Yes, diagonal is probably enough. But this is something that would be uh, something we should have to do only gain from. Experience. Testing. Um, we will need more time to, yeah, sure, sure, sure. to know that. So, before thanking Bernardo for his presentation, I'm not sure if his supervisor wants to say yeah. something about his yeah, work. I can make some comments. So, first of all, I'm sorry, I'm a bit sick, so I'm, I'm giving my best. Um, so, I would like first to thank also, uh, I would like to thank. Um, Bernard for his uh, work and his effort. I'd like also to thank Claudio for, because you, know, you mentioned all that all these people worked, but you did not mention yourself. So <laughs> you made a uh, huge effort to, uh, to be close to the students and that deserves some acknowledgement of course and that was uh, a great effort from you so I thank you very much for your support. Um, Bernardo, can I ask you to go back on your presentation? Uh, uh, where? To this slide that says, uh, I don't know, problems. Okay. 
Yes, problems encountered. So I'm looking at that uh, image that you put there. So yeah, I, I noticed that you enriched slightly <laughs> the presentation with yeah. the images. Uh, I, I like your presentation. Uh, let me just say, although it's quite simple, but I think it's straight to the point, and you managed to mention more or less all the difficulties and the challenges that you face. So I think this is okay. Uh, I got very much fun of huge and lengthy, uh, very you know, great uh, design presentation, but my content. I think your presentation is short, so the straight to the point. So this is a very good thing. Uh, but <clears throat> when I look at that figure, I um, I think uh, well, if you put that there, then it's probably because you learned something. I am saying this why? Because uh, this is uh, exactly what you feel when you are working in research, right? You have a lot of questions in your mind. Uh, many times, uh, many times you feel you are facing some situations that are completely new, and this is mostly uh, what you face. And I guess this says a lot about what uh, people uh, are willing to do to uh, to finish their uh, the, what what they're supposed to do. I think you, you you made this. I think if I could find some uh, some comments to address to you, it would be that I believe that you did a good job uh, considering all of the circumstances, and this is the most that we can do and most that we can say. We always would like to have a deployment in all the building. We would like to have the control of the lines in some rooms. But we had two months. Uh, you worked uh, <coughs> often on your own. So uh, uh, this is something that, uh, is, uh, that needs also to be acknowledged. And uh, considering all of these things, I think you did a good job. First, you, you are using a technology that was completely new to you and uh, that was still on the test. So I think this is uh, obviously you face many problems because of this. But you uh, have what I believe it's important to have in research, that is the strength of will to face the difficulties and not to give up. And this is something that is uh, very, 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 very important. Okay. So, uh, I, I don't know what else I can say. I think this sums it up. <laughs> but from my perspe perspective, uh, uh, it's a good job. Um, I want that report. <laughs> I'm already <a>, started. <laughs> okay, don't forget to commit to the repository, to the Git. Okay. Um, uh, I think this is worthwhile to pick up and to continue later on. <coughs> And so, thank you very much. I hope that you learned uh, also with this experience. I'm sure, like I said, from that figure, I'm sure that you did. Uh, because, you know, when you face, uh, I think the major obstacle is our, ourselves. So when you face ourselves, uh, then you are, uh, you are learning something, right? So uh, thank you very much for this. Thank you for uh, participating. And I hope that you enjoyed this also as much as I did. Well, maybe I could. I uh, could have given you more support in some times, but I mean, this is all part of the circumstances that we have to face. It's like this. Mm -hmm. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Bernardo. <laughs> now we have Vostislav and uh, Enric. Okay. Uh, they will present. Uh, their project entitled a real-time CPS system with a Raspberry Pi. So basically they develop a cyber physical system which included one sensor and one actuator using um, um, the Raspberry Pi as the as a control. Um, this project was uh, developed under the supervision of Paul Waterage and I guess that you have the word now so you can start. Hello everybody, so how about the producers, uh, I'm Enrique, this host lab, and our project is about the uh, prototype of uh, real-time CPS, a cyber physical system with a uh, Raspberry Pi. So to, to introduce, uh, our, we will talk about uh, our project, the proposal, uh, the hardware that you use, all the, all the electronic things, and uh, about uh, the, the Linux modification, the very important part, 
uh, about uh, also uh, how we connect all the things, how we integrate the, the real, uh, the, the physical device with the Raspberry <coughs> programs, and then show a little demonstration and talk about uh, our the issues found in the <coughs> talk we'll discuss a little. So this is a, a photo about our project right here. And let's let's talk about the, the proposal. So the idea behind this project uh, is to modify the Linux kernel. So, so uh, the idea is to implement three uh, real-time schedulers, uh, earliest deadline first, deadline monotonic, uh, rate monotonic, implement it in a Linux kernel, compile that Linux for a Raspberry, install it, and this will give you uh, give us a. a uh, custom real-time schedule for, uh, for the processes uh, running on the Linux. And the second part, uh, or the other half, is to create a, a, a circuit which would, uh, which would uh, connect a, a bunch of sensors and then actuate it through, through the uh, GPIO uh, pins from the Raspberry. And then create some um, programs, processes, which use these uh, sch schedules which we implemented and control um, our sensors and actuators. So this is the basic idea. And okay. So uh, to see all, all the complete part, we will divide in the, each part. So we starting with the, the Raspberry Pi. We used uh, the, the first version, the Raspberry Pi 1, with the model B plus and uh, revision 2. It's a lot of uh, configurations that uh, change uh, a little, but the important things between one version and one revision from the other that uh, influence in our uh, way to use the, the GPIO mostly. Uh, this Raspberry has just a, just a one core, the single core CPU, with the just uh, uh, 512 uh, megabytes. With uh, through the AR and AR and V6 <coughs> family with uh, 32 register bit registers and just uh, 26 uh, GPIO pins. This is our model, and uh, different the other versions come with more pins, more uh, more possibilities, and uh, this is a uh, very uh, basic, but uh, enough to to see the, the work. Uh, so the, these 26 uh, GPIO pins. The GPIO uh, means the gener gen general purpose input out output is the, the phys uh, physical interface between the Raspberry and the, the physical device that uh, allow us to control and monitor the, the data, to, uh, the input data from different devices and also uh, send some data, some control <laughs> to each device that we, we want. Uh, from these 26 uh, pins, we have uh, 17 that uh, we can uh, use to, the, to send some digital uh, information or get. And <coughs> so the other pins, the other nine are uh, some power or ground. Uh, from this, from the power, we have the five volts, and also one of the pins is just uh, three dot three volts that uh, is uh, uh, well used to some uh, device that doesn't uh, that can't uh, use uh, can't uh, put uh, all the entire five volts. Uh, in the output, we have some details. the The high voltage. Uh, when send the uh, one bit one, we have just the three dot three volts, and the low we have zero. And uh, in the inputs, all the inputs are digital, so we can't uh, use devices, uh, analog devices like uh, sensors. We, to use uh, some sensors or some device that uh, needs uh, that sends uh, analog uh, signals, we need to use some drivers. It's not very simple to just connect uh, and. Uh, read this, uh, all the device that we, the electronic device that we, we have uh, in active. And also we have some pins with extra functions like uh, just one pin to the PWM that is to control the, the, the speed or to control uh, the variation 
of the signal, the output signal, and uh, that we use to in the, in the motors. And also we have some uh, pins uh, with the full connection, uh, the full configuration to the to the communication with like the one wire, the I2C that is two wire, and SPI and the RXTX or also uh, the, the clock we can get from the, the Raspberry and use in our external device. So we can see in that image our uh, Raspberry and uh, we have the 26 uh, pins with uh, the numbers, the, the, the physical numbers in the center and uh, some uh, of the this is specific um, functions from each pin. Uh, to use the GPIO, uh, one important thing is to uh, set and see how we use uh, the, the configuration because we have a lot of different uh, configurations to, to, to recognize the, uh, the, the pins numbering and the pins uh, functions that uh, the Raspberry provides for us. So we use it, uh, some, uh, the GPIO can, can be programmed with different languages, so for that uh, we, uh, we, we decided to use uh, C and C++, C++ with uh, some libraries that we, we get uh, is uh, the Broadcom DCN 2835 20, library and the YEV, both are libraries that, uh, that uh, recognize and use the, the C language and uh, allow us to configure the better and in a way easier way the pins, the GPIO pins, and also uh, allow us to use in a, not in a very low, um, very low language the, the functions that we need, like the PWN and, and the ready sensors. And uh, to use that libraries, after install the libraries in our, in our system, we need to include in our codes, in our programs, the, the header, and also uh, when compiled, we need to, to put the, the library. So here, just uh, in that image, we can see uh, the different uh, ways that we can control the GPIO, the different uh, numbers that the pins has, and we, we need to pay attention with this because uh, also in the, in the default uh, language, in the default configuration, from the Raspberry, uh, some uh, from one version to the other, we have uh, different uh, um, different uh, names and numbers. And just to 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 see, we have the we can in our in our system in our program, we we use the, the physical location, the physical numbers in the middle. Uh, then the BCM is the, the from the BCM library, YDP like I told, and the advanced capabilities. There are some uh, examples in that image, like the, the clock, the PWM, and the other readings from the inputs. Okay. So, so we made some uh, modifications in the kernel. So we basically have. Uh, we have implemented the three, uh, the three schedules that I mentioned. The LSL enforced, the, which is short for AD, uh, short but, but to ADF, the Lamontonic DM, the Lamontonic RM, which I'll be used, using uh, later in the slides. We have uh, implemented a tracer uh, for, for, our, for our schedules. And this would allow, uh, so if any process is using our schedule, all of the events associated with it will be um, logged, and you can then access that log um, through, a, through a file, system file. And we also have some system calls to allow processes to use our schedules. So, um, so the, the three schedules. <coughs> so, so we have, um, so we we have used a single uh, scheduling class in the Linux kernel for the three schedules. And each schedule uses a red black tree, binary tree for the red queue. So uh, this tree um, has, has a, a key, <coughs> and that key is uh, associated with with each uh, schedule. So so each each of these schedules um, t takes an attribute from a, a real time process. So a real time process 
can have a, among other things, a relative deadline, uh, absolute deadline, and a period. And so to have this deadline to calculate um, which process has higher priority, use the absolute deadline, uh, which we, in the kernel, uh, have implemented with a relative deadline, plus, uh, we, which is a calculation in the kernel, which we, we cut with some the relative deadline of the process plus the system uh, time at that moment when it enters the run queue. Uh, so uh, that's for the ADF, for the M, uh, the key for the tree and the, the, key, the, the attribute that decides the priorities is the uh, relative deadline. And for RM, it's uh, the period. Um, so these are uh, our system, co uh, system costs we created in, in the kernel. This uh, allow allow processes in user space to uh, to use our schedules. So um, this here uh, is to do with the um, with the tracing, which enables our zeros. But the most important uh, system call is this one, uh, which uh, which allows a a process to choose one of our three uh, real-time schedulers, so uh, ADF, DM, or RM, so it's 0, 1, or 2. It, uh, so so the, the process will send that, the, the schedule it wants. It will send uh, the parameter associated with it. So if, if, um, if, if, you have, if a process wants to, to run in, a, in, our, in our DM uh, schedule, it will send uh, one, to send um, the relative deadline in the lower and the higher four bytes. So th this parameter is eight bytes, and it will send a, a basically a boolean, which, which which says which can be zero or one. And this says if uh, if if the process is running in the CPU, if we uh, this is one, it means it can be preempted by uh, another process in the same scheduling class, which has a higher priority. So th this is useful because, because some of our, our um, programs which control, um, which contro control the sensors and the motor, they, 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 uh, um, they need to execute uh, um, some timed commands and they cannot be interrupted because, because if, if they are, they, they, uh, they can go out of sequence. Okay, so, so here uh, uh, we have a, an example. So we, we actually used a similar structure in our in the process that, that control that, that control these uh, sensors, which we will see later. So the first thing to do is to, is to use this uh, system call. So you will set uh, the parameters you want, in which in which are then saved in the kernel of that process, and then you will. Uh, use the system call to actually, so so a process when it starts usually, it's usually running in the CFS in the schedule in the kernel. So you, here you will uh, set the parameters, and here you will actually change to the schedule class seven, uh, and the process will ch change into our schedules, and it, it would already know all these parameters which it needs, and so and then you can actually do do some work. So for um, a real-time process. It's usually uh, a cyclical, um, cyclical process. So we have an example. So you can have, uh, uh, have a few loops here. We, should, we have the uh, computation portion of the uh, process, and also something that uh, the, the detection of deadline misses needs to be done in user space. So we, here we, so you would uh, have to log in yourself. In user space, and in, in the end, you would you would use uh, you would uh, put the process to sleep. Uh, what this does is um, um, well, if there, there is some time left uh, until until the ne next period. But this is also important for uh, ADF because this is what updates um, the absolute deadline. Of a process because in the ADF, in the kernel, we, we only have the uh, relative deadline. And so the process needs to get out of the run queue and go back in, and the absolute deadline will be updated. 
So, uh, continuing. Continuing, uh, just to, to describe our device that we use it, and then to, see, to talk about the connections um, uh, with the programs. Uh, the, first, the first device is the sensors. We decided to use uh, in the beginning a, a very simple sensor, uh, temperature, tem uh, from temperature and, re and humidity sensor. Uh, these both uh, models uh, are, very, uh, are very similar, but uh, the, they, have a, they, they have a good uh, reading. Uh, we just decided to read the, the, the temperature, we ignored the, the humidity. And uh, have uh, the, we also uh, change after after test both both sensors. We also ch uh, change all the sensors to the DHT22 because uh, has a better range of the temperature reading and the sampling is better. Uh, but uh, we have a, a important. Uh, uh, the day is about the with the, the sample rating, simply rating. We just can read each uh, uh, each measure uh, in which two seconds in the DH two uh, DHT twenty two and with the DHT eleven uh, with one second every one second. So in to 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 demonstrate the the real time is a. Uh, Sometimes it's not uh, the best idea because we want to see in, uh, very fast the, the readings, but uh, we we have we still use these these sensors. So uh, this sensor uh, have uh, just one one wire bus, but it doesn't have uh, a standard communication. So we we implemented the the protocol in C. We made a protocol that uh, from this image, uh, from the data sheet, we can see how the, the communication happens. Uh, we need to send some, uh, some signals from the, from the host, wait some, uh, uh, to create the communication. So we wait the, the, the check from the sensor that sends, and then finally we can uh, put the, the same pin that we in the beginning use in, in output to send the, the, the value. Uh, we change to input to finally get the, the readings. Uh, so, like I said, uh, the response time is uh, a little large. But uh, also, the, other, the the next device was the is the DC motor. It's a regular DC motor that we use it like a, a cooler, a fan. So. Uh, this DC motor use needs a, a, a supply that uh, from uh, supply six uh, volt six volts, and uh, to control the, the motor we use that uh, we need that to use a, a driver to the L 293 d that we talk uh, very soon, and uh, we use it also the PWM to control the, the speed of the motor. Also, we use it from uh, like a, a, another actuator, uh, incandescent light bulb. To, to actuate like uh, as a heater, uh, to to have a better uh, to control better the not only the the, the environment temperature but uh, to to get uh, some uh, real control data in uh, to to manipulate uh, the 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 controlling the readings uh, from the sensors and see uh, a real control happening. So to this uh, to this actuator, you needed to use a, a relay. You tell. In the DC, some uh, the DC motor. We so you use this driver. This driver. Uh, uh, why to use the driver? Not only put the, the motor directly in the in the in the Raspberry. Uh, because because the Raspberry uh, in the output has a low voltage. And also has a low uh, pass to the, the GPIO pins, uh, a low current, and this uh, this is very dangerous when we're using uh, actuators like a motor that consumes a, a lot of uh, current, and this can this can damage our uh, Raspberry because the the GPIO doesn't have a a good protection uh, to all the uh, all the pins. Uh, 
so we need to take care of this and we use this driver the this driver no what the driver the driver uh, let us uh, connect uh, motors that uh, can use uh, external supply of until 36 vol uh, volts and um, and inside this driver we have a dual bridge dual wage bridge that uh, allow us to control the the direction of the, the the rotation so in both directions and also we have a pin just to determine the pwm uh, the, the, the to variable to variate the the speed of the motor uh, so the PWM uh, actually is the pulse width modulation that we use to control the speed. And in Raspberry we have a uh, uh, limitation because we just have one pin that uh, has from uh, default uh, configuration of PWM that allow, allow us to to control uh, how many times uh, how many times the, the output will be uh, high or low. So this basically is how the, the PWM works. We control uh, the pulse, uh, the time that the pulse stay in height uh, related with the, the entire time of the cycle. So if we have, uh, uh, for example, uh, the half time of each cycle with the height, uh, height value, so we have the 50% of the, the speed of the, of the motor actuating. So in, and this is named, this, this value, uh, value is named uh, that cycle. So uh, we implemented a code to control the motor. And uh, also, and also to control uh, another actuator, uh, the, the incandescent light bulb that uh, after our, uh, our first month we saw that we, we could uh, improve the project uh, putting some heater to, to manipulate the, to create a, a, a simulated environment uh, temperature. So uh, uh, because of the time uh, we, we decided we needed to, to do the model because uh, we didn't have time to, to buy so we use this uh, we created this circuit and uh, created this model is a custom model that works very fine with a relay that uh, allow us to control uh, a device that use a high voltage and control led from a low voltage like the the Raspberry that use for example the 5 or the 3.3 volts and with this, with, this, with this voltage, we can control uh, a device like the lamp that uses the, the 240 40 volts, 240 volts. So, uh, so after uh, after have the, the sensors and the actuators, we we needed to 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 work with the shared memory that that allow us to. Uh, to use a memory that um, simultaneously accessed by all the process that uh, we had working at the same time. So uh, we use the inter-process communication method, the, the most uh, typical, and uh, that uh, has a, we put in a region table uh, we use an array that is a shared memory table uh, that point that has a pointer to the region table and with this we can con we can uh, get the, the values from the temperatures uh, read it from the sensor and uh, start in the in the in this in this uh, shared memory and then with the other process from come from the the motor uh, use these values to control the, the the motor. So here we have the, our prototype and we show a demonstration. <coughs> and the, the video we got to, to, to work here. So, 
I put here. Uh, I put again. So we in the in our launcher we are choosing uh, two sensors and the zero here means that we will put to infinite loop and we are using the scheduler uh, the end. So we put to execute and we our target uh, temperature now is uh, set in uh, 22, 22 degrees. degrees. So the the lamp uh, starts starts. Uh, to hit the, 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 the environment near the, the sensor and uh, when the, the value comes uh, to 22 degrees the, the lamp to turn off and the motor that has a fan uh, starts to work and so we try to, uh, to control in this target uh, value. So now for example the value is yeah, and also in our PWM uh, program, we put uh, uh, the speed to to vary uh, according to the to the temperature. So the when the when the value comes uh, starts to be very near from the 22, the, the motor starts to be very very low. So that's it. So. Thank you very much for no, your presentation. No, it's not done, not done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> oh, okay, okay, so, so right now I'm going to show you uh, some uh, some graphs about some example graphs. So, uh, th this is a uh, uh, so, t so we so we, we did a run of the system. We used the, the logs of which from our tracer. We have put those logs uh, into a uh, Python script to create this uh, graph. And this graph here, uh, let's see the time which, which is in, in seconds. So it's here is one second, two seconds, and these ones are, are the processes. So this corresponds well to what you have seen here: two sensors. Uh, one and zero uh, motor, which is minus one one, and, the, and so these are uh, user uh, custom schedule. It's using uh, RM, and, and here at the, in red you can see the total, uh, the sum of all um, process times from uh, process times from our uh, schedules. Uh, so you can see uh, our sensors sort of um, start more or less at the same time. And uh, because we, um, we we are starting to have a, a system call to not be preempted, so first um, a process does its execution from start to end, and even if this process has higher priority, it does not preempt it. Uh, and so and here the motor is a bit offset from, from the sensors, a few more seconds, and you can see that uh, um, the utilization of the CPU is very low. So to remedy that, we have created some like, sensors. So this one, this is a array. Also, we are using five se uh, five iterations because that's what we could fit. But you can do many more iterations. Uh, so this is a, a fake sensors, uh, which which we have used to, to basically uh, to try to st uh, stress the schedule systems a bit. And this fake system basically just does a busy, busy wait and just writes a memory to it. So this is all, only one fake system, but you can have many more. Uh, only one uh, will fit in the shop. Uh, oh, and also, um, I don't know if we have mentioned, I think, uh, the period is one second. Uh, but the objective was to have a period of um, around 30 milliseconds. And we, and we, it's one second because the uh, temperature sensors uh, only allow uh, a reading frequency or a period of two seconds. If anything less than that, and the temperature readings uh, become uh, 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 they're wrong. Uh, so, uh, and we also try to test it with a basically this is a so, th so these are basically just. Uh, also, this was ADF, this run. Well, uh, this is real data. We have used real data to create these shots, <coughs> and this is uh, DL. 
So these are uh, sensors, motor, and we use a lower priority uh, process, which basically just does a bit busy loop for uh, five seconds. And you can see that uh, so this was set to be uh, preempted, and you can see that it gets interrupted by uh, sensors and motor when they start. Yeah. Yeah. So um, during this pro project, we had some issues. Um, we had some issues in the beginning with the branch of Linux we, we were using. So, so for for um, for the base of our Linux, we used the the uh, official Linux for the Raspberry, which, which is you can find on the Raspberry website. So we used this branch, which we had version 4.13, which uh, which had a broken uh, Red Lab 3. So we switched to 4.9, which is what um, we are running at Raspberry, and and it works more, uh, more or less. Uh, we also had a problem with uh, passing eight bytes and. and uh, 8 byte integer uh, through a Cisco, which, which, which was the Cisco to pass the parameter, um, parameter of the process. And, and I didn't mention, but the parameter is in nanoseconds. So you re really need 8 bytes to, to be able to say that your process has a period of 8, sec of eight seconds. So we saw this by just splitting it in half. And we also have some stability issues in these last weeks. And like I told you, uh, we have the problems, uh, a lot of uh, the problems with the, the physical device, like the temperature, the sensor time, and uh, the, 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 the variations in the GPIO means are very, very uh, difficult to, uh, we always have uh, some, uh, some routes, some signals uh, difference, so we have this, this difficult problems, but uh, we can see uh, the final the final part. So thank you everybody. Uh, any questions? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, actually I have two. The first one is about the, the cooling subsystem. It looks like it was engineered from scratch. Uh, did you consider using one of those uh, coolers that can be found inside the desktop computers, power supply units or, s or something like this? Like USB? Uh, yeah, something like this. In yes. that the, this motor? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, ch the, the choice of this uh, uh, of this subsystem was because of some reason, or you just wanted to do everything by yourself? Or can you comment on this? Uh, the, in the part of the motor, we, if we, we use the, the, the cooler from the, the computer, we, we would have the same problem because the, this, uh, the motor from this cooler uh, used 12 volts. Okay. So, in the same way, we need to integrate some kind of uh, driver to, uh, to get this external power supply. If, the, uh, if it, we just connect in the Raspberry, uh, we can see if it's a, a, a regular and not a so, so high uh, voltage, we can see the motor running uh, very low. But if it's a, a, a good motor, like this, uh, at least this cooler uses uh, more, more power, more voltage, so we, it tries to consume more current to, to get the same, uh, to the same um, um, energy. So, so we 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 see that uh, a lot of times just with this motor, uh, the Raspberry just turned down because uh, some interference or some uh, current that uh, he doesn't it doesn't have a, a separate system. It's very very simple the, the the GPIO in this this version. I don't know if it, in the other versions they have more uh, they implemented more kind of. Uh, Protections to to the to connect with the external part, but in this uh, we have these these limits. Yeah, and what about the the, the quality of suggestion? Imagine you take the uh, USB uh, Raspberry Pi should have the USB ports, right? So imagine you take some uh, USB uh, fan, you connect to USB port of the Raspberry Pi. You think it also would make uh, problems like you're saying? Uh, turning down the um, the Raspberry Pi, or maybe it's just connect. Uh, uh, the motor in the USB? Yeah, yeah, something like this. Or using a direct USB frame instead of the motor. <coughs> I mean, okay, you could interface with an USB. We can't, uh, that's the same way, because if, you you put US, a, if we have a control. Yeah, I don't know if uh, we can control uh, yeah, okay. from the, in the used USB, we can control some device, 
But instead, uh, even if we can, we will have the same uh, the same thing. We will just uh, send us five volts because in the USB, mm -hmm. we always have these limits in uh, these electronic uh, issues. In this, for example, the the, the lamp that uh, use uh, uh, more and more voltage. And you can see this in a, a bigger uh, is a is a more spe more uh, specific exam example how how we have uh, these limits. And in this case, you, you can have like a direct control of the, the voltage itself, probably using some USB devices. Yeah. You have another layer, and probably use. You, I'm not sure if you are able to use or uh, put any kind of uh, real-time current over the USB mm -hmm. kind of port. I'm not so sure. Yeah, because because with the USB you can send the the energy, but we we. We can't uh, use the USB maybe with the PWM function. That is uh, no. <coughs> we could probably implement something close to it by doing on-off switching, but that would mean that you have to have control over the USB hardware. So if you switch on-off at some rate to to the equivalent PWM. Yeah, but the time, yeah. It's, but uh, it's not a. Uh, but then I'm sure if you yeah. if that would be difficult. So, Paul, I'm not sure if you have something to yeah. say. Yeah. Kelly? So, I think it's a very cool setup. I'm just curious how how large is your sample rate for the sensor? Uh, the sampling rate? The sample rate? The, uh, how long? Sorry? So, how large is the sampling rate? How long, right? Yeah. The same. The same rate. One second, one second. Yeah, it's one, one second, but you can set it into program. But it's around one second because anything lower and the readings are, are wrong. The temperature. The sensor does it, the sensor hardware doesn't allow um, a period lower than around one second. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, one second. Uh, and also in our protocol, we, we did some filters to, to because sometimes the, 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 the value goes very, very high. That's so we, we have in the in our photos we have uh, uh, we have the bad checksum that uh, that shows so us. Uh, so, so if you set it lower than one second, the whole screen just fills with bad checksum. So, so that's the reason. All, all these lines with this uh, this trace uh, this this uh, bad checksum are not uh, we we remove this, these readings and uh, use the last uh, value we save it in the memory. So you we did this. Did you observe that the, the, the sensor value is quite variant um, in the in the data? Uh, sorry. So, so the sensor data. So sometimes very high, sometimes very low. No, just sometimes uh, doesn't read. But uh, the the value is uh, usually is uh, is very accurate. Okay. I'd say it's around 10% uh, of the time, if you set a period of 2 seconds, 10% of the time the value, or 20%, the value is invalid with the sensor. How, how, do, you, how do you solve the end of uh, this error? Uh, well, the sensor stands a, a checksum, which you check. So if the checksum is, is wrong, bad checksum, we simply don't use the value because, because the the process for, for the sensor basically just reads, reads from the sensor and writes to a single uh, entry into shared memory. So, so if there is a valid, um, valid temperature, it writes, but if there, if there isn't a valid temperature, it doesn't write. So we did two, two, uh, two things. One was that uh, we, we removed the bad checksum, the, the bad preparators that uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't, uh, is related with our range. And the other things, we, we, uh, there are three things. The, the second thing, we reignited uh, <coughs> our range that we want to read in, the, in, each, uh, in each running, running time. <coughs> and uh, also the last part, uh, we, we did a mean so with uh, two readings. So with this, we can uh, get, uh, uh, in, in our example, we just get the, the highest value. But uh, we also use the uh, means uh, of the both, uh, both uh, readings. Just a very quick question. Your control loop is over one second then? Yeah. Okay. So you have, because my next question is if you have explored the limitations of the kernel patch in Linux. Right? 
Launching uh, through real time operating system. <laughs> what we did, right. what we did so is my, my question is that if you had explored it, but obviously with one second, with one second. Yeah. Yeah. what we did was uh, <laughs> create, <laughs> create any <laughs> fake. Uh, we create any fake uh, sensors to see the all the CPU. Uh, so uses. it's probably more than enough for this kind of application. So all. Yeah. Um, I, uh, first of all, I, I would like to let you know that this is the first attempt to use real tasks instead of fake tasks. So, and uh, as you uh, could see for the, the discussion, some of the problem that uh, these guys uh, had to face is related to the tasks, for instance, or related to the hardware because uh, we cannot assume that, okay, we would like to have a period of uh, 10 milliseconds because it's the more appropriate for a real-time system, but actually cannot be because... It's physics. Yeah, so, and, and this is a, an important issue be, uh, because, as you know, um, from the theory to the practice, there is a long... <laughs> Gap that Small we gap. need to <laughs> to to bridge. So I think I I, I, I did something in this in this particular case. But okay, doesn't matter. Um, so and there is uh, another thing that I would like to 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 highlight in this work is they don't use a, a, a device. They build the device. And uh, okay, uh, another thing uh, is. Raspberry Pi is a special device, it's not a, 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 a computer. Okay, it's a computer, but it's a computer with some limitations and they have to face some problems. They, they first use an approach and they have to replace. Okay, they use good practice, so this change was not uh, so penalized. So, and what I have to say, uh, these guys are, uh, it was a, a great pleasure, uh, pleasure for me to work with, uh, with uh, uh, them, uh, because actually I didn't have uh, too much work. So, <laughs> but it, was very, it was very nice, they, they, everything that is here, they uh, uh, implement everything, they did everything. So. Sometimes I came here and they uh, said everything is okay. But there is one thing, one requirement that I request <laughs> and I didn't find. First is what? Beer. Where is the beer? Here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are here to show you, show you our final project. Uh, as Claudio was saying, we are about we worked on Camu and on a wrapper 
to interact with it. We will start by explaining a little bit better what was proposed to us. Then we will talk a little of the research we had to do before we actually start building the wrapper. Then the structure that we planned for the library. And in the end, we will talk a little bit of the graphical user interface we have to build. So we could show you a little something of the library and a little demonstration. So the proposal. <coughs> so as Claudia said, we, we are supposed to build a, a wrapper for the, for, to use Camel. But that's incomplete. We actually had uh, to alter the, the source code of Camel to support some functionalities it, it doesn't support on the main branch. So as, as I said, we had to develop a library to manage multiple virtual machines uh, running on top of Camo. It would work similarly to VirtualBox. You can start the machine, you can stop the machine, pause, and run other commands supported by Camo. So uh, Camo, uh, each instance has uh, attached to it a monitor in which we, you can send commands to it, like the start, stop, but it's not very user friendly and it, it follows uh, some semantics you have to learn before you can use it. So uh, this library, uh, which we, we, will need to, we, we needed to program to communicate with Camu, it's, it should work uh, similarly to the monitor system. It should use uh, the monitor interface to communicate with each instance. So, and the last requirement was to modify, modify the Camu source code to support different execution speeds which might be interesting in, uh, in order to some testing or uh, if you run um, older systems on the, the, our CPUs, they, are, they run too fast and it might be inter interesting to slow them down a little bit. So to achieve what we uh, propo then proposed, we had to study a little bit of how the monitor actually worked and how could we communicate with the camo. Our first try was to use signals, the CPU signals. <coughs> uh, it worked, uh, we could do some basic interaction, but it did not feel very native. It, we, feel, we felt it was not the best option to use, so we tried to find something else. We started to examine the source code of camo and we found the monitor and we start uh, to try to communicate with the monitor and we actually achieved that. So we tried to understand how the monitor interacted with the Camu itself. And we found out that the monitor already used sockets and it was communicating through TCP uh, information. So we decided, okay, if the monitor is communicating through sockets, maybe we can build our own sockets and <coughs> interact with the Camu there directly. And that's what we have made and it works. We can send uh, commands directly to the Camu. So about the timers, um, as I explained, the Camu speed is not uh, constant. It, it varies <laughs> according to the host CPU that runs that, gr that runs it. So we we noticed that we can we had to study the, the timer system of Camu in order to be able to find a solution to slow it down. So we found out that Camu actually had an even an, a new throttle mechanism. Uh, it, it would be used, it was implement, It was in the source code, but it was not used in any functions as of now, but it was used to help uh, some process uh, during uh, machine migrations. So uh, we found out that uh, we actually can implement our own uh, camo commands and we actually built a camo command and implemented it in, uh, in our branch of camo. So, with the, this research done, it was time for us to think how we could actually implement such library. We first thought of a singleton instance, which would be the manager, that would be uh, the interface to the outside, 
of the application, everything should be sent to the manager and to the inside of the library, the manager uh, should be the one communicating. So the manager will manage uh, multiple instances of the KMU and will be able to send them specific commands. Uh, some of the commands are uh, already implemented, uh, such as continue, the stop, the, the shutdown, but we can actually send any command through the execute, which uh, accepts a generic a written command, which will then be sent to the KMU instance, which in turn has a, a client, KMP, which is basically a, a, a TCP client that has some kind of pars a parser to transform the command into a JSON structure that the KMU will understand on the other side. It will then send the, the, the JSON and will receive the reply and send it back to the manager. All of these operations are logged into a file so we can trace what's happening and if some bug is occurs in the in the middle we can see it uh, because this is not supposed uh, it was not the objective to be a graphical user interface it's uh, it's uh, built to to be integrated in another project so the logger was also very important So now about the uh, graphical user interface. Uh, the, the user interface itself was implemented in Java, but actually uh, we, we, me and Mirels programmed uh, this library, this camel library, uh, in two different languages, Java and uh, C++. So uh, it should support all the, the functionalities from the manager and uh, it, it supports uh, a historic of commands run in, in, the, in, the, in the libraries. So about the C++ integration with Java, we used the Java, Java Navi, native interface. Uh, it has uh, some constraints, a lot of constraints actually. It needs to be perfectly synchronized with the, the library. Uh, first, the library must be compiled into an actual library, uh, DLL in Windows and uh, SO in, in Linux. And it must follow the, exactly, the exact same method signature and in the it, it's 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 hard in the in the C plus plus side we had to map the variables into Java variables. We have to save the pointers in order to communicate because each uh, native interface call is an, has a new scope. So uh, it's the first time we had to work um, in 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 this kind of integrations. So I actually made a mistake uh, two days ago uh, in in Git. So it's not. Currently, it, it's not synchronized, so it actually doesn't, doesn't not load the library. But before this, we before we implemented this graphic user interface, we actually implemented each in each library a, a console application, which we used to test it all, and it, it, it's all all the functionalities are supported. Uh, to demonstrate you, uh, since there was a little uh, issue with the integration and it was not supposed to run on this uh, computer. We don't uh, have ISOs to show you uh, the machines actually running, but we will show you uh, something. First, we will show you just some print shots, we, screenshots we, we took. This is the, the graphic user interface in which the user will select which library to run, it starts down there, you can select the commands, it will then order the command, in here we are starting a machine, we say which kind of machine we want, this is the reply that comes from the KMU side, for the time being it's not actually receiving any kind of treatment, it's the response it gives. Uh, and here we can see the instance that was started. It's not running on any ISO. In here I built another instance and ordered to execute another instance. And there we have a new 
instance, we can see the socket number that changed. This is the 30,041. This is the 40. Since each instance needs to communicate through sockets, we, we give the user the ability <coughs> to define the first socket, and then every instance, it's the next socket. In here, we built a script to stop the, the machines. This is the EIDs of the machines. We order them to stop. This is the reply. And you can see it down there in the CAMU that it says paused. <coughs> and this is after I shut down the machines in the button, they closed. And you can see also the history of the commands. It shows the order that they executed, the command, the script, and the results. And before we end, I can show it a little bit. This is the UI. I can select the <coughs> Java version. Start. We yeah, are not saying that. Sorry. C. Okay. Now. <coughs> so we can. <coughs> oh, we are not saying that. <laughs> select the library, uh, in this case it was was not working, we can start it, afterwards we can uh, start the machine, we have to write the executable name because they are very uh, different instances, we can write to camel system, system. It is. It's slash. right, execute, it executed, Porter. 40 <laughs> and it's there it's starting to run I can order it to stop selecting the ID it stops it says paused I can order it oh better yet I'll build another one camo system Another kind of it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I just oh, I just prepared it. Yes. So now I have to execute it. What why do why have we done this? Because the client said he he may want to actually first introduce all the data of the instances but not to run them and run them later. So we have the now to execute it manually. So it runs. It runs there. I can do many, many things. It actually allows to hold the file configurations. Uh, I'll make a script. Uh, an instance one, for instance, it stopped right here. Yes. to continue. Uh, instance uh, stop for instance and you can see that they swap the first start is continue the other stop that's the return the, the, the camel gives so we can do many many things shut down for instance I shut down to it shuts down if I press shut down, it will shut down all the, the active instances and we have hi the history here. We can see what <coughs> I've done, prepare, execute, the script, the shutdown. We can see everything and if I order, it allows me to reselect the library 
and Bezirica <coughs> to show you how the trunk of this is working. That's a question. Since it was not prepared to run on this, it okay. was not meant to be running here. I don't have the camo. I will show you the, the different version of camo. So here we will have to show on this computer. <laughs> Since this project is messed up, we will have to use the console application to, to show it. Not the like. So this is the console version of the, the UI. So we can create a new Camo instance. It's actually it creates a, a x86 64. Um, so we can start it. Which instance? So we we only have one instance now. So we start this instance. It actually starts it. So um, okay. Now we can execute commands on it. Okay, let me just. Just it's a little smaller, so we can see. So let's execute a command on it. First, we need to enable. Actually, my friend made it automatic, but we need to enable a little permission on the game instance in order to to run commands on it. So on on instance one, we want to enable PMP capabilities. So it's now enabled. So now we can execute all the commands. So uh, the throttle, right? So we'll throttle at um, 90, 95% of the, so it, it will run at only 5% speed. So we have to run a human money. Note that when we, we actually implemented this on the GUI, and it, this was all abstracted, we didn't need to run all these commands, it was abstracted by the GUI. So we want to throttle the CPU by 95%. By 95%. So it, it was working. Now I'll show you by uh, rebooting the machine. You will see that it's usually instant to reboot. Okay. Now it, it will take a, maybe a lot of time to reboot because I think it's system reset or system reboot. Let me try to just pause it. I'll say system reboot, usually. <laughs> yeah, probably system reboot. <coughs> Some mistakes happen. I guess that's probably for sure the details that I, I got. So, uh, how much of the, I mean, was the GameU documentation helpful at all? No, it was. <laughs> It was very bad. It was very bad. We had to uh, basically. So I I took that most of the time to you know, to find this uh, thing. You have to look into the code and see how it was. Actually, the main objective of our uh, our project was not the the library or the UI. It was the the implementation of a uh, of the slow down of schema. But we actually did it. After some time, and we had some time left, so we are, we went to advance a little bit. So we built the library in the UI after it, because we finished the library as well. Okay. So in the beginning, the purpose was to build the a wrapper to the library, mm. and we didn't know all the functionality, as you were saying, uh, because the Camu is not well documented. We didn't know all the functionality, or all the Camu exposes this kind of functionality to third-party applications. So the, the goal was very basic, so let's see how we can build a, a, a small wrapper to, to use to, to create, to dynamically create these instances. Then as we figure out, so uh, we start finding information through, through code, then we start building the library and then, at, uh, then in parallel uh, Renato was able to work with this CPU throttle. And actually, we again we didn't know how to implement that until we found some uh, uh, lost functions that 
uh, already implement this kind of functionality that they were supposed to actually be using some different, I mean, with some different words. <coughs> and then Renat proposed to reuse this, uh, this functionality to implement, implement the throttle mechanism. And we said, okay, try it. And then it did, and they successfully managed to implement this. So I would say that, uh, so this was uh, more of a research project than anything that we, I mean, in the beginning we didn't, we had some small requirements that we wanted to fulfill, but we didn't know exactly how to actually implement all of that. So after uh, uh, reboot, no? Yeah, it is reset. Yeah, it's reset. You can keep speaking. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, I would say that uh, Actually, we are happy with what we have so far. We still have a lot of uh, a lot of work to do ahead. But our our goal is to actually include this now in a, in an ongoing project that we have at System. So, uh, and um, I would say that uh, the students uh, concluded with uh, success. That's my. Idea. You can see that it's uh, much slower now. Not uh, not as slow as not as fast as before. But if we. Now we can see it's very slow because this is usually instant. There's, there's just another thing uh, that I there's just one thing that I really dislike about this and it's why Java? Why? Ah, uh, okay. Why Java? I, I, I did the second explanation. I can see that second question. You could use anything else. I did the C++ side, it's nothing to do with No, me. because I, I actually in the beginning, uh, so we have two students, okay? In the beginning, we were supposed to have one version of the library implemented in C++. Okay, that was the, the goal. But then we realized that once we found the information, that would be too little for them to do. Okay, so we decided, okay, let's first have, so let's have a version for C++ and a version for Java. Or for the library itself. Then, um, then we split up the work and not to start working in the CPU throttle. And then Mayrell started to work with the GUI interface for the, um, for the library. And then finally we decided to use, so for GUIs we decided Java because it was easier with uh, the amount of time that they have left. It was easier to implement uh, GUI interface in Java. I mean, we had other options that would involve like web uh, technologies. Uh, QT or QT. I mean, I don't know. Like that. No, I know, I know. But I, I felt that uh, the learning curve for them and with the amount of time that we had available, that probably yeah. would be yeah. better. Yeah. I have an answer by Java. No, and so. actually, there's another actually important thing. Uh, at this end, don't say it's possible because QT is also possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even no, 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 no. Actually, I propose QT and uh, GTK. Okay, but uh, these students here at ISEP, they start learning Java in the first year. So they Java are all the time. They are experienced programmers uh, in Java, so that's why in the end they decided to go for Java because it would be faster than to go for for Qt or uh, or even GTK. Okay. Because I mean, I'm, actually, I proposed Qt or GTK, but then I, I looked to the time that we had available, and then okay, you, you did a good job. Why Java? So people were complaining about the bad documentation, right? Yeah. So these guys, they write oh. a Java doc, and then they press button, and they already have the documentation. It's all written. It's all written. Yeah. And, and the second thing, the second thing, I didn't finish it. The second thing, just go uh, indeed.com and check the jobs, and then you see how much offers are uh, for the job. Ah, yeah, okay. That is the point. But that's, <laughs> that's, that's, right? that's, okay. that's quite debatable. That's quite debatable. <laughs> Yeah. No, with Android nowadays, <coughs> it's quite trendy to because, find. Uh, I'm saying QT because I, I'm not advocating QT over anything else. You know, I don't, I'm not being paid to buy QT. So I, it's, uh, I actually I tried many different UEs over the time. Um, uh, the reason is that QT recently is much more advanced than, than it was uh, five or ten years ago, right? It's, uh, it's, it has, so it is quite well documented and it's also now supporting embedded device development. So uh, it's being actually used in many of the cars uh, uh, cockpits. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, yeah, no, no. so there are there are some it's also gaining uh, uh, gaining some uh, but for Oracle would not sleep at all. <laughs> if you check the future release of Java nine, they say they are targeting it for yeah. IP. <laughs> I don't know how, but they do. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I already have <laughs> 
So they had already some inside inside the Tell us <laughs>